Good afternoon. My name is Laura Mishu. I am the Executive Director of the Supportive Housing Network of New York. Thank you all so much for joining us today. What we need now in federal housing policy. This panel kicks off our first of our Network Friday Forum series, a panel series that we are hosting every Friday at 1 p.m. running through early November. Please mark your calendars and visit our website for a full list of workshops. We have topics ranging from this one on federal to supporting staff, racist policies and homelessness, crisis response, and much, much more. We developed this series to help us move through and beyond the COVID-19 pandemic and reflect on our policies and structures and how they support structural racism. We hope this will help us emerge stronger and more equitable as a community. Next Friday, September 25th, we are very pleased to have Brittany Packnett Cunningham in conversation with our own Tierra Labrada. Brittany is a leader at the intersection of culture and racial justice and a lifelong activist. We look forward to this important conversation. And if you haven't already, please register. For today's forum, we look forward to hearing the latest on the federal landscape that is ever changing. Any hope on seeing a COVID-19 relief package before the election? Where are we on LIHTC reform? Plausible solutions for 2021? We're very excited to hear from all of our panelists today. To all of our listeners today, Please, we need your ongoing advocacy on a federal, state, and local level. So pay attention, watch out for our emails. From a housekeeping perspective, all participants are muted. Please put your questions in the Q&A. The session will be recorded and on our website. Lastly, thank you to Richard Roberts, who is moderating our panel today and a network board member. To our panelists, Peggy Bailey, Sarah Sadian, and Emily Kadick. We have a powerhouse team of women with us. And thank you to Steve Piasecki, Joelle Balamschwam, and Emily Levine from the network team for putting together the panel. And thank you, thank you to our many, many sponsors. We, we greatly appreciate all of your support. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Richard to kick off the panel. Laura, um, thank you, thank you so much, and thank you for that uh, that kind introduction. I'm, I'm Richard Roberts, as Laura mentioned. I am a uh, network board member um, and have been very involved in affordable housing and community development here in New York City. Uh, I'm currently a principal and managing director at Redstone Equity Partners, a uh, tax credit syndicator um, that's uh, that's active, obviously here in New York and and throughout the country. Um, as Laura mentioned, we we have a a stellar panel, a stellar group of folks who are joining us today, and we're really looking forward to, uh, to the conversation. And I want to emphasize something that Laura said, which is that we're really hoping that, uh, that participants can use uh, the information that they hear uh, on today's panel and in other um, sessions where they may uh, come in contact with uh, discussions around federal policy and use that to contact uh, your elected re representatives uh, and be knowledgeable about these issues so that we can help kind of move, uh, continue to move the affordable housing agenda generally uh, in Washington, but also uh, the agenda that's so important for us here in New York State and New York City. Uh, as in this critical time, um, uh, I think the conversation will reveal uh, we are more and more dependent upon, um, you know, what happens in, uh, in Washington um, more so every day. So uh, let me introduce our panel. I'm going to do so in alphabetical order, uh, if they don't mind. I'm going to start with Peggy Bailey, who is the Vice President for Housing Policy at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities um, in this capacity. She oversees the center's work to protect and expand access to affordable housing for people with low incomes. Uh, prior to, uh, to being, becoming the Vice President for Housing Policy, she served as the Director of Connecting the Dots, Bridging the Systems for Better Health a center initiative that identifies opportunities to strengthen the link between, link between housing programs and health policy. Um, she's had a very extensive career in housing, um, uh, health, the intersection of the two, um, and we're really looking forward to, uh, to um, hearing from, uh, from Peggy today. She holds a BA in government from the University of Notre Dame and a Master of Public Affairs degree from the University of Texas at Dallas. Um, 
We're also joined by Emily Kadick, uh, who is the executive director of the Affordable Housing Tax Credit Coalition, uh, where she leads the advocacy uh, effort to support affordable rental housing finance using the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. Uh, prior to joining the coalition, she was a senior director of public policy at Enterprise Community Partners, uh, where she led policy and advocacy related to the housing credit and other affordable housing and community development issues. Um, she uh, was involved with the Action Campaign and has uh, been involved in a variety of different lobby lobbying and advocacy efforts. Uh, before joining Enterprise, she was a presidential management fellow uh, at HUD, uh, where she served as a program coordinator for the Moving to Work demonstration. Um, she earned a master's degree in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Texas at Austin. So we've got this Texas theme, this UT theme uh, on the panel as well. Um, Sarah Sadian is the Vice President of Public Policy um, for the National Low Income Housing, uh, National Low, Low Income Housing Coalition. Um, and she is responsible for their broad congressional portfolio. She also worked previously at Enter Enterprise as a senior analyst, uh, where she focused on appropriations for federal housing and community development programs, um, and uh, also held several positions where she focused on, uh, prior to that, where she focused on federal policy as well. Uh, she graduated from the University of Connecticut School of Law after receiving her bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia, um, and has been a member of the Virginia Bar since uh, 2009. Uh, so. Uh, if I get in trouble in Virginia, I know who to call. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I'm going to throw this out to all the panelists and whoever wants to answer. I, I had never, I, I just didn't think coming into an election year uh, that there would be a, uh, uh, a chance that we could experience a government shutdown. Like there could be a, an issue uh, around trying to figure out how to continue to fund the government. Um, that has apparently been an issue, um, and I'm just wondering if you all want to comment on that and talk a little bit about where we stand with, uh, with the budget, the continuing resolution, and so forth, and just uh, uh, educate our, our participants as to what's going on in Washington with respect to the federal budget at the moment. Uh, why don't we start with Emily, um, and, then, uh, and then we can hear from, uh, from Peggy and, and, and Sarah. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. I uh, wish I could be joining you all in New York, but nice to be able to join you virtually today. Uh, a lot of surprises this year in, in many ways, but one of them is certainly not only that, you know, there's still a question about what's going to happen with the continuing resolution, but I also didn't think we'd be here in September with all of the benefits that were passed in response to the coronavirus pandemic having uh, mostly expired at the end of July. I thought, you know, surely they're going to pass some more COVID relief before they go out and start campaigning. And, um, you know, it's hard to be shocked by things anymore, but I'm still shocked that not only did we not see more coronavirus relief, but that it looks pretty unlikely to happen this month as well. So, you know, as of where we are today, it looks like there's a pretty good chance we'll see the clean continuing resolution pass next week. We're, we're still trying to see how long it's gonna go, um, but at least avert a shutdown for now. But the coronavirus relief talks that you know many of us thought would be attached to a continuing re resolution there have been some attempts that haven't really gained a lot of steam so it's looking like i think i'm interested to hear what the other panelists think but i, I think right now it looks like the likeliest is we get a clean continuing resolution and, and really nothing else happening this month and then of course everyone goes back to campaign so we're now looking towards the end of the year to do a lot of the things that we need to see done. Um, the need is only going to grow by then. So if you know cost was a deterrent this time around, it's going to be even more costly. But at some point, um, I, I hope that Congress will feel sufficient pressure to act. Um, and I hope it, it is before the end of the year. We were certainly hoping for this year, but um, it just doesn't look very likely right now. But like I said, interested to, to hear what my fellow panelists think about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Emily, I would uh, second that. Um, that it doesn't. It, the 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 continuing resolution is definitely going to happen next week. Uh, but uh, and be clean with with very small with very with very few changes. Uh, and as Emily said, we don't know when it's going to 
um, what it's going to go to. It's either going to go till after the elect, immediately after the election, maybe November. It could go into December. What we do, the thing that I would add to what Emily said is, you know, depending upon the results of the election, that stretch from, you know, no, November 4th through the end of the year is going to be crazy, <laughs> to say the least. So it's going to be really important for us as uh, and, and the advocacy community to stay, to really step up our game between now and then to explain the need for housing and rental assistance uh, before the end of the year. Because we know that even though the Centers for Disease Control issued an order, uh, uh, an eviction moratorium order that ends December 31st, people are still going to be accruing rental debt. And December 31st, what is, you know, how are low income people going to be able to pay back rent magically on January 1st? So we have to figure out a way to pressure Congress and the White House to move forward with a uh, with a new relief package that includes a substantial amount of money for rental assistance and make sure that those folks that are at least um, avoiding eviction today will continue to in two th in uh, 2021. Yeah, yeah. Sarah, you have anything to add on on on, on that front with respect to the, the continuing resolution and so forth? I think my colleagues really hit on some of the major points, but I'll just add that advocates in this virtual room and elsewhere in New York have been doing a really great job of uh, educating Senator Schumer and other Democrats about the need for uh, emergency rental assistance and uh, resources to prevent outbreaks among people who are experiencing homelessness. We have a lot of congressional buy-in from Democrats in support of these resources. They've been holding the line very firmly um, and, and pointing to the need for uh, these resources and their public engagements and when speaking to the press. And that's really because of really strong advocacy work that's being done in New York and in other places. Our goal right now is, I mean, it's beyond uh, frustrating and a kind of perplexing that Congress would leave uh, with an economic turmoil on hand and with people who are in desperate need of assistance, but um, you know, I guess things just keep getting worse and worse here in DC. But I think that that there's a lot of opportunity, whether it happens before the recess or not. It, it certainly seems like it's in a prime position for uh, when we come back after the election. Yeah, and 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 and, and Sarah, just to just to carry on with that. So we had CARES, right, which 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 provided, uh, you know, among other things, PP. Uh, the, the PPP loans and, and a, a variety of other, you know, a variety of other uh, uh, initiatives. And, and then, and then heroes was, you know, the Democrats came in and very quickly um, adopted heroes. And that has kind of been dead on arrival um, on the, on, on, on the Senate side. Uh, was it last week or earlier this week that the speaker said that she was going to, she was going to, to, to keep everybody uh, in DC to try to figure something out because there was a, there seemed to be a smaller, um, smaller package that some bipartisan group had put together. Um, and, and so where does that stand? How does that relate to heroes? And is that compromised piece of legislation, does that include enough rental assistance? Because the he heroes um, really seem to focus in, in, in a primary way on rental assistance and to address the, the issue that Peggy uh, appropriately uh, discussed when, you know, all of this kind of, you know, all, all this game of musical chairs with eviction moratoriums and all this kind of comes to a stop, right? People are going to have to pay rent. And so um, there, there did seem to be something in Heroes, but I'm not sure uh, where we are now. Yeah, that's a great question. So the HEROES Act included $100 billion, at least $100 billion in emergency rental assistance and about $13 billion in other resources for housing stability. Um, you're right, it's been, it's been waiting uh, on Mitch McConnell's desk for the last several months. Um, last week we saw a, a bipartisan group of House members called the, the um, Problem Solvers Caucus put out a framework for what they thought could be a deal that would get forward, a good, could go forward. 
It only includes about $25 billion in emergency rental assistance and no money to address the needs of people who are currently homeless. And so it's far less than what is actually needed to address the problem. But I think the bigger issue there is that there's really no buy-in from House or Senate leadership, Democrat or Republican, about backing that proposal. Um, we did see that Speaker Pelosi said uh, she'd be willing to keep the House in session until a deal is met, but that's maybe a little bit more wordsmithing than it is about actual changes. Um, members will still be going back to their districts. They'll just be on call in case the deal is, is cut and to come back to make a vote on it. But because right, they're, they're they're running really they're running for re, they're running for re-election, right? I mean, they they've got to go back to the district, right? Yeah, and, and there is increasingly more pressure on Pelosi, especially from newly elected Democrats who might be in more conservative areas or more purple states um, to do something before they go back. But um, there, there just doesn't seem to be a lot of urgency, especially on the side of Senate Republicans, and that's dragging down a lot of these negotiations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Peggy or Emily, you want to comment on um, heroes or, or any of that nature? or, or um, I, I do have a question. We talked about rental assistance as, the, as a component of, the, of, the, um, of heroes. There's also certainly a big question that we've been watching here in New York. Um, and so just to, just to lay the dynamic, um, you know, we have, a, we have a significant budget gaps at the city level. The city is making requests on the state. The state has significant budget gaps and the state is making requests to the federal government. And there seems to be a, a, a significant amount of, of I, don't want, I, I don't want to call it um, um, posturing. Uh, what I would say is there seems to be a significant amount of, of, of concern that if one level of government steps out and does something bold to address its, its, uh, its problem, that it will somehow leave the federal government off the hook and uh, mitigate the need for, uh, for significant assistance for state and local government. And so um, th that also seems to be uh, an issue that the, the Senate Majority Leader doesn't seem to like rental assistance, and he doesn't seem to like support for state and local government. And so uh, that's another big component. I, I'm imagining that, that we, we really have to wait to figure out how, the, how, things, um, how things shake out uh, before we see what happens with, on, on that topic as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm, it's hard to, oh, go ahead, sorry, Becky. Oh, no, I was just gonna say a little bit of what's playing into that dynamic too has been, you know, a slowness, um, you know, slowness from HUD of getting some of the dollars out the door so that there's also this not wanting to get and, and and guidance and waiting for guidance to come out to make sure that communities are spending some of the dollars you know just a hesitancy of being concerned that uh, they might spend dollars in a way that hud doesn't want them to and so that dynamic is also kind of playing into it where there's also a concern about getting too far out in front of of hud also i would say and, and that that dynamic though has also created a little bit of a of criticism in Washington of state and local government of not using the money uh, as well, correct? Right. Well, yeah. As and as you pointed out, a little disingenuous, right? When HUD, if the dollars, all the in, a good bit of the community development block grant dollars just went out last week or the week before, last last or maybe earlier this week, but just went out the door, right? And so you know you can't exactly say that states and localities aren't spending the money when they haven't actually gotten the check yet. Yeah. Emily, you were going to make a comment, I think. Yeah, I was just going to comment a little bit more on the dynamic that you described, which I, I think is right, that um, there's some, some bigger ticket items that Democrats want that the Republicans uh, are not interested in coming to the table for. And I think, you know, that a deal could be struck if there was some part of the relief component that Republicans wanted badly enough to be willing to give in on enough rental assistance or on state and local funding. But right now there just um, doesn't seem to be that, that interest or pressure from the Republican caucus. And so unless there's something forcing their hands to come to the table, um, 
you know, it's just these things are kind of staying in the Democratic wish list bucket and there hasn't been any progress. Well, the one yeah. thing I would say, though, is that when the CDC moratorium came out a couple of weeks ago, Secretary Mnuchin did say that rental assistance was needed to go along with the moratorium. So that was um, one indication that um, that that it, it, that the issue is does have a, some bipartisan support and that we're getting caught up in these bigger political issues. Uh, that are at play when it comes to the relief package, that it's not, you know, I don't want, I want to just make sure that folks are clear that it's not just rental assistance that's on the table, and it's not rental assistance that's holding up the efforts. It's, it's much bigger inside the Beltway politics that's holding up the, the, um, uh, the negotiations than it is rental assistance. And, and we've heard from both sides of the aisle that rental assistance is important. Yeah, that's and, and a really a good point. bit of that is the landlords that have weighed in because they really want to get paid. <laughs> that's a really good point. And I think it's it's A, it's about these bigger political issues. And B, I should have clarified, I was describing congressional Republicans. I do think that the White House is more interested in playing ball on a deal, but um, the, the Senate just really isn't moving. Right. So there was a question in the, uh, there was a question in the chat, which I think you guys just addressed. I was going to wait until the end, but I thought it was relevant to the discussion, which is um, uh, Dan Bianco says, are red states slash cities not having housing issues? Are GOP electeds not experiencing any push for help? And it seems from the answers that, that you all provided, they are. It's just that they're paying much more attention to these bigger macro issues that are holding up a deal as opposed to um, the specific focus on the on the housing provisions yeah i mean uh, there are a lot of very vulnerable senate republicans who are up for election this year and they're certainly weighing in behind the scenes in support of reaching an agreement the problem is that in any deal 10 to 20 senate republicans aren't going to vote for it which means that there's a very divided republican caucus and that makes it more difficult for mitch mcconnell to uh, you know, drive a path forward that doesn't expose just how deeply divided his caucus is. Um, I think that uh, it's it really, really, again, it's kind of surprising that when you have Tillis, um, Gardner, Susan Collins, McSally in Arizona, all of these folks, take, you know, facing really tough reelections that could put the Senate in jeopardy for Senate Republicans. Um, that they wouldn't want to pass a relief package that their members could take credit for. So it's sort of, you know, politics are a little bit on their head right now. And I will say that part of it could also just be a negotiating, uh, negotiation tactic for Republicans. We do know there is one thing that they care a lot about, and that is making sure that there are liability protections for businesses that reopen, something that Democrats are not really open to. Um, but, you know, that could point to some sort of a deal if Democrats were able to get their state and local fiscal relief and these other measures that they wanted. We just haven't seen a path forward on that just yet. Right. So let's talk before we leave this topic. Let's talk about timing uh, of it. Um, so um, if we assume uh, and I think it's probably a pretty safe assumption and you all can either give me a thumbs up or nod your head that um, if you were to bet that you would bet that we not see a, a coronavirus relief bill prior to the election. Um, all the all the panelists are nodding um, <laughs> that uh, they agree with that statement. Um, if we were to see something in either lame duck, so let's take lame duck. If we were to see something in the lame duck session, what set of what set of of um, what scenario would would be more likely for that to happen? Uh, the the Republicans lose the Senate, and therefore the therefore the um, uh, are they more motivated in, in that in that in that scenario? If if the president loses and the and the and the Senate and they lose the Senate, are they more motivated or less motivated to to pass a to pass a a bill, in your view. I, 
Okay. So I think conventional wisdom is they would be less motivated to come up with a deal before the end of the year <laughs> that um, conventional wisdom, uh, you know, you know uh, says that or from what you know what we're talking about, you know, at least in the office is that if if the Senate flips to Democrat and and Vice President Biden wins, it is more likely that the end of the year is going to be pretty chaotic and that a relief package would is going to have to wait until um, uh, until the new administration, I think um, that's right. that's at least what right. uh, what I think. Anybody else on that point? I just think it's really hard to game out. It, a lot of it also comes down to the presidential election, too, if it, and how much Republicans are valuing things like the liability protections. If they think that yeah. that's their last, last yeah. opportunity to get those liability protections, they might be pushed to a deal. Um, but I think it's like Peggy is saying, you know, politically, they would want to see a Biden administration weighed down with having to pass this in their first 100 days instead of passing some other big priority that, that he might have, right? They want to be able to waste and spend his political capital, um, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, okay so l let's move to uh, – thank you for that uh, discussion around the relief package. Um, Let's let's move to uh, LIHTC, Emily, and um, just kind of, you know, where we stand. We've been, you know, for many, many years, um, you know, both with your participation and with your leadership, uh, been building a very strong kind of bipartisan um, coalition and support around the credit. Um, and uh, people on both sides of the aisle like it. They like it sometimes for the same things they like it sometimes for different reasons um and um but, but we we've got a pretty comprehensive um uh piece of legislation that would really really improve things dramatically uh that's uh that's around and we're kind of trying to move it forward and to a certain extent on a much smaller level on a micro level it's suffering from many of the same dynamics that uh that we just talked about with respect to um, uh, the coronavirus relief package, which I guess is just just the state of affairs in Washington. So, you know, tell us a little bit about the uh, the, the Credit Improvement Act, uh, what's in it, uh, and uh, and what are its prospects, and and what do you see kind of the you know how do you see it kind of playing out over the the next couple um, uh, months and and maybe into the new year. Yeah, well, thanks. I think you set the stage really well. We we do have a long history of bipartisan support for the program, um, and as you said, sometimes for different reasons. And similar with the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act, which is the legislation to expand and strengthen the program, which also has a very extensive list of bipartisan co-sponsors. And you know, sometimes those on the left side of the aisle are signing on because it, there's a significant new infusion of resources and. Um, you know, more incentives to target extremely low income households. And then we've got a lot of members on the right signing on because it does more to make the credit work in rural areas and to help veterans. And there's kind of something in the bill um, for everybody, just like the program kind of, you know, has, has a little something for everybody and everywhere. So we came into this year with already having more than half of the House of Representatives signed on to uh, the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act, everyone from Ilan Omar in the Progressive Caucus to uh, Mark Meadows, who left to go become President Trump's chief of staff. So we've got really the full political spectrum supporting this bill. And, um, you know, to your point, we've, we've got all the support. We just haven't had the right train leaving the station to get any of it done. Over on the Senate side, really strong support as well. Uh, Minority Leader Schumer has been a huge advocate of the program and very attuned to the need, uh, especially now, to get the 4% rate done. So thanks to all of you for helping to make that case. Then, of course, um, when the crisis hit, you know, having all of these uh, co-sponsors on a non-crisis specific bill doesn't get us very far. So we've really been pivoting to focus on the need for the 4% rate specifically because that is one that's um, not only become more of a problem because of the crisis with the cuts to the federal borrowing rate, the 4% rate's now down to 3.07 and we don't really expect it to go back up anytime soon. 
And also we've been told that, you know, the parameters for any of these next pieces of COVID legislation are going to be, you have to have a direct tie to the crisis, not just, you know, stimulus infrastructure. We'll get to all of that later. If you can't show the immediate need, um, you're not going to make the cut. Now, of course, if the next bill isn't passed until December, they're, that's going to have to change a little. We're not, um, you know, if it's not this immediate emergency response anymore, there may be an opportunity to add some more. So things like what we saw in the House Infrastructure Bill, HR2, the Moving Forward Act, you know, we saw the 4% rate in there, but also an increase in credits, uh, more flexibility around bond financing, the extremely low income uh, provision that I mentioned, uh, an increase in private activity bond resources. I won't go through the whole list, but there is about a dozen provisions for the credit that have now made it through the House, been introduced in standalone legislation in the Senate. And depending on what shape or form the next bill takes, you know, we would see if we could add some of those as well. So um, all that is to say, we're, we're keeping on the pressure on the 4% rate. We actually just had a conversation with um, Majority Leader McConnell's office yesterday and a few Kentucky groups who were making the case for it said, oh yeah, 4% rate, we've been hearing a ton about that. So the message really is getting through. And of course, a lot of the people who work on the low-income housing tax credit program have also been uh, crossing over and helping to advocate for rental assistance as well, since it's all part of this ecosystem that all needs relief. And we realize it's, you know, hopefully not, uh, not, not just one or the other, but that we can do everything we need to for housing. So that's where we've been focused. I do think that uh, depending how the election shakes out, there could be a lot of opportunity to finally take this bipartisan support that we've been building for years and you know, got painfully close to getting some of these housing credit provisions across the finish line over the past couple of years and actually enact them into law. Um, it's been an important part of the Biden campaign's platform. He's got a lot in there for housing and the housing credit's part of it. And you know, we're all kind of assuming the House is going to stay in Democratic control. But whether or not the Senate flips, I think that taking this bipartisan set of proposals is actually one of those things that could, could actually make it through either way. Um, if there is a, a second Trump administration, we'll see. Um, we had made some inroads on, on the credit with them before. Of course, the president's been making some comments recently about affordable housing that I'm um, not so sure where he stands on, on the program anymore, but we do feel like we're well positioned for any of a number of uh, legislative vehicles that may be leaving the station in the next few months or, or maybe more likely early next year. Yeah, so, and, and, the, and the, um, uh, thank you for that. And it's, it's, I think, a couple of points just for the, for the audience. One, uh, I can't emphasize enough how important these, um, these provisions that, uh, that Emily uh, uh, listed and, and, and are available on, you know, the Tax Credit Coalition's website and, and, and other places um, how important they are to our work here in New York. I mean, we are so uh, heavily reliant upon, uh, upon the credit. Um, we pair the credit with, uh, with the state credit. We pair it with, uh, with various forms of subsidy. Um, and ecosystem is really the right, is really the right term. And, um, and, and we really need uh, these, uh, you know, these provisions at some point to be, uh, to, to be pushed through. And it's, it's exciting that we've got, so much support uh, from both sides of the aisle. It's just a question of you know trying to make it, uh, trying to make it happen. The j just so people understand, Emily, the 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 um, uh, it says it in its name, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. It is a tax provision. It presumably needs the um, needs to be part of changes to the tax code um, in order for it to move forward. And like the coronavirus relief bill, that changing the tax code is a big deal. Um, and sometimes uh, for a variety of different reasons, people want to do that or don't want to do that. And then that has implications for how our specific provisions can, can move forward or not. Um, and so that that's so you can have a you can have an individual legislator who is very much in favor of the tax uh, uh, of the low income housing tax credit and the program, but for a variety for whatever reason 
doesn't want to monkey with the tax code uh, in any particular given session. And then that will create a, um, you know, that will turn a friend into a frenemy, so to speak, uh, in, in, the large, in the larger scheme of things. <laughs> yes, um, I, I like the term frenemy used there. <laughs> um, I, I think you, you explained that very well. I was actually just uh, explaining to a family member the other day how bipartisan what we work on is. And she said, well, if there's so much support, why is not it passed yet? And it's like, well, good question. But um, tax bills are few and far between. And unlike, say, on the appropriation side, where Congress really does pass bills every, sometimes every few months, but, but generally every year, uh, there's nothing motivating uh, the tax code changes. I would say the extension of expiring tax provisions has been a motivator, and that is something that, that we hope will come up in the lame duck session, because we're viewing that as a, an opportunity for some of what we want to do. But there's, there's a lot of members who are very protective of the tax code, and if you start doing one tax provision, then you have to do all of these other things. So even when the CARES Act came together, for example, and the HEROES Act, you know, we were trying to get the 4% rate provision in, and we were told we're not doing any industry-specific tax provisions because if we start doing affordable housing, then we're going to have to do something on new markets. We're going to have to do something on energy credits. And there's just so many members who have their interests in different parts of the tax code that it's usually either a huge tax bill moving that has a lot of different provisions or it's nothing. Now, the last time we had a big win on the low-income housing tax credit was in 2018 as part of the omnibus. And the only reason we were able to get a tax provision or there was not supposed to be anything for tax was because there was a mistake in the tax reform bill and Republicans needed to fix it yesterday or would have changed farming in America in a way they did not intend. And the Democrats got to pick one thing to get in exchange for that, and they picked an expansion of the low income housing tax credit. Now, opportunities like that do not come along very often, which is why we've been teed up. I mean, they are getting sick of hearing about the 4% rate. There just hasn't been a big tax bill with these industry specific provisions for a while. So. Uh, could be a year-end bill, could be early next year. It's really just, um, it's not a question of do we have enough support, it's where are they drawing the line on any of these individuals. Right, right. You, you, you generally don't like to hear the term clean bill, right? Because that, that generally means that they want to limit the, the scope of things to the specific issue at hand and don't want, to, don't want to include a lot of other stuff that could potentially help us. Right, we like what they call Christmas trees where everybody gets to hang an ornament. <laughs> <laughs> you know, who doesn't like Christmas? Everybody likes Christmas. Um, so, um, the just briefly, um, any uh, anyone want to prognosticate not about who's going to win the election uh, or win the White House, but in in a in a Biden, let's pick Biden because Emily referenced something that we're going to talk about as it relates to the president. Um, but as it relates to the Biden administration, how, how do people feel about a Biden presidency for, uh, for affordable housing, uh, for affordable housing generally? Sarah, and then, and then maybe Peggy. Well, I think that there would be opportunities to expand resources for housing under a Biden administration. I think he's made it really clear that he has a focus or interest in an in infrastructure package. And as Emily mentioned, the House already passed an infrastructure bill that included housing both on the tax side and on the spending side, including about $70 billion for public housing repair. So there's a robust focus on housing in that Democratic proposal, and an infrastructure bill could be a way to move that forward. Um, I think beyond that, though, there, there certainly are opportunities that come Next year, the Budget Control Act will no longer be in place, which means that Congress won't be tamped down on what they can do on an appropriations bill like they've been for the last 10 years. That's had a big impact on their ability to expand resources. The, like cap, the, the, caps are, the caps are going away? They're done. We're sick of them already. <laughs> they run out their course. This is our last year. For 2022, so in, in thinking... So Sarah's right. And what I mean is, you know, the budget conversation for 2022 yeah, starts next yeah. year is no yeah. cap. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Peggy, what do you think about a Biden, what do you think about a Biden presidency for housing? 
So I think the thing to point to is that Senator Harris it would be the vice president. And Senator Harris has quite um, a few proposals on the table that um, speak to affordable housing, including um, uh, and in, in, including being supportive of the low income housing tax credit, but also, you know, a renter's tax credit proposal that's a little different than ours. Our, our renter's tax credit would go to the property owners and hers, I think, goes to renters, but still um, trying to think about the ways that we help make uh, affordable housing affordable for people at the lowest incomes is obviously a priority of hers. So that's one of the places that we've been looking at is doing a looking at the list of housing proposals that 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 her office has introduced and that is another signal around affordable what afford the affordable housing could be a priority for the next administration, but I do encourage folks to read um, the Biden administration's build back better plan because I, 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 I finally like kind of dug into it on the website it's it's really an easy easy read and and you can see all um, a, a good list of the priorities that we have in the affordable housing space i think you know as emily uh talked about though it's always about the vehicles that are going to move and the problem that could happen is if relief gets pushed off uh there's that package then there's conversations about um, bigger infrastructure or climate change or health. And it's going to be up to us in the, in the housing world to make the case as to why we have to be a part of any of those, um, what hopefully will be Christmas tree proposals that'll come, that'll come along. Yeah. Uh, thank you. That's helpful. The, um, the Trump administration, um, you know, my sense, and I, I guess, uh, anyone who wants to comment, uh, my sense is that there, there have been people to talk to about, um, about the, the the housing agenda that we that, that I think we all you know on this panel and and on the call would um, uh, would be supportive of. Uh, how um, the president has routinely done one thing, which is he uh, in his executive um, his executive proposal on HUD, he every year slashes you know proposes to basically slash the HUD budget and to, in some instances, kind of almost zero out programs that, we, that we've that we come to rely, up, rely upon, whether it's home funding or other, uh, other types of sources of support. Um, and then he, uh, and then what seemed to be more of kind of a campaign rhetoric, um, he has um, uh, made just recently some very kind of antagonistic comments that, that Emily referred to as it related to um, related to affordable housing, not knowing if those are really kind of directed at the affordable housing agenda as much as trying to motivate um, people uh, to vote for reason, for whatever reasons, you know, he, he deems are appropriate. Um, is that kind of a fair, is that kind of a fair characterization of the administration? You know, there's a, there's, there's, you know, some receptivity on the part of some who work there to engage on the issues. Uh, but um, there is this kind of almost annoying uh, assault, um, which kind of, uh, you know, rears its head every, every appropriation cycle. And it's kind of uh and it kind of wastes a lot of time and energy on the part of everybody involved because Congress on a bipartisan basis then comes in and, you know, ignores it and then does whatever they want to do. So it's kind of a weird, it's kind of a weird dynamic. Yeah, I, well, I mean, I think with all due respect, Richard, I think you're being overly generous maybe to the administration. Um, I okay. think, uh, and I think a clue of that is, is uh, you know, at the center, you know, we, we are very active on Twitter and uh, and and in the things that we say and, you know, and we as a nonpartisan, you know, centric center, center uh, of the aisle, even though sometimes we get labeled as being very left leaning. Um, they've allowed me to to uh, and the housing team really to talk about the racist and discriminatory things that the administration has done. I would say that the characteristic the, the way that you characterized it was the way it was the first couple of years, but definitely in the last 18 months, their, their policy is aligning with 
the political rhetoric that's happened. So if you think about the, the um, you know, rolling back the undermining the fair, the fair housing act through rolling back the affir affirmatively furthering fair housing regulation from 2015, the um, rolling undermining disparate impact, the, um, the recent regulation which, which comments are due on Tuesday around equal access for transgender and non-binary people and access to shelter and, and, and making it possible to discriminate against them. The regulations around uh, immigrant families um, who have uh, who ha who uh, and 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 make and make and um, and 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 proposing to take rental assistance away from some immigrant families. Uh, all of those things are real, and and if um, and are the things that if President Trump. Um, wins are the things that we're going to have to really mobilize in a way that we haven't as a housing community before to raise up from some of our um, more siloed industry interests to fight back on these bigger cultural housing justice issues. Right. And, and before we, 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 we dive deeper into those issues, I just want to point out uh, for, the, for our audience that all of our panelists um, have uh, extensive experience and track records as it relates to uh, not just affordable housing, but the issues associated with equity, fairness, and inclusion uh, with respect to affordable housing. Um, and so uh, I know with respect to Emily's uh, career, you know, the, the, uh, the fair housing um, rules programs are near and dear to your heart. I know you worked on them. Um, and so this is a, um, this is a very, very aw awkward and scary time uh, when the occupant of uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue uh, decides to um, actively and aggressively um, include as part of his rhetoric, um, you know, the, uh, these issues in a, and, and to put them in a very negative light. Um, and so um, I, it, it's, it's a, and then Peggy, you've correctly identified these specific programs and specific things that, that need to be addressed in order to reach this goal that we have of inclusion and diversity and, and, and equal opportunity. Um, and so I'm just, uh, I would be shocked. I'm shocked to hear that they've been they've been so antagonistic to uh, to the uh, you know to the programs. Yeah, yeah. I think Peggy made a really important point too about um, when when these attacks are made, it's not usually about one program or another. I know some of our members have said, you know, is he talking about the low income housing tax credit or is he talking about public? You know, what I I don't know. I don't know if you know others in the administration are are giving it that level of nuance. I think when you know, low income housing is attacked generally, all of the programs, um, you know, we all need to kind of, whatever our priorities are, come together and just, you know, defend the basic premise why we're all here providing housing for people who need it. Um, I did want to flag one other item related to both this topic and your previous question about a Biden presidency, which is, um, this didn't get a lot of fanfare, but the Democrats, uh, Senate Democrats, led by Senator Schumer, did come out with an Economic Justice Act proposal about maybe a month and a half ago, and probably gonna introduce it as formal legislation. The idea of that bill is to promote investment in communities of color, and housing is a big part of that. Um, the minimum 4% rate was included there, uh, renter credit, rental assistance, all that. And so when we think about what might um, a Biden presidency do, I think it's, taking some of these bills that have already been passed and vetted and already have support like the infrastructure bill, but keep an eye on the Economic Justice Act too, because I think there um, will be a focus among Democrats on going in the opposite direction from the one we just talked about. And um, I think it's important that housing is being seen as part of the conversation on helping communities that have been disinvested in. And um, having a lot of the, the items we've already talked about be included in that is just gonna position them even better if there's a democratic shift next year. 
Right. Sarah, I want to give you an opportunity to comment on these on these issues if you'd like uh, to to add something. Yeah, I just want to point out and underscore the points that Peggy and Emily made about calling this administration's act racist and just how harmful they've been. One thing that underscores that is that it's. Uh, they, in the early in the administration, they had talked about the need to reduce zoning barriers and land use regulations that would prohibit affordable housing and other housing from being built. They they went on their high horse and they talked about it a lot and tried to get a lot of press coverage around it. And then, of course, they come and they eliminate or roll back AFFH and they and the president is going on the political campaign talking about how harmful it is if low income housing is built in your neighborhood. And really, it's it's clear that the zoning part uh, they might not have an issue with. It's the the point of AFFH, which is to undo racial segregation, is the part that they really have an issue with, right? Um, and I think what's the most at stake here is that I'm not so concerned about the administration pushing for budget cuts because we have Congress that can act as a buffer. But as Peggy said, in the last two years, they have been going at all cylinders to roll back regulations specifically around discrimination issues and protection issues, that is where they put all of their focus administratively. And I suspect that if they were elected for another four years, we're gonna see a lot more and deeper attacks in that space. That's their priority. And is, and is, Congress, is Congress fighting back uh, from the standpoint of, uh, you know, at least in the House, are they fighting back on these with oversight and hearings and? investigation they are, and, and they are but at the end of the day the only way to stop the administration from harmful regulatory actions is if congress can reach an agreement and while the house might be very active in this senate republicans don't have a lot of uh urgency on this issue either right they're not very open to or not as open as they should be about reining in the administration on these issues so we haven't been able to see language for example on the senate side to stop them from uh, rolling back AFSH or the equal access rule or anything else. And so I suspect that if there's a divided Congress, we're gonna continue to see um, the Trump administration unfettered in its attacks on uh, fair housing and civil rights. Yeah. And um, speaking, I, if I could just add one thing on our congressional support, one question I've been getting is whether the president's comments have been uh, making it harder for Republicans to support affordable housing in Congress. And um, I'd be interested if uh, Peggy and Sarah feel differently. I don't think it's having an impact yet. I think a lot of Republican members you'll find are kind of like, oh, did the president tweet something today? I, <laughs> I guess I missed that, you know, and, and kind of um, brushing past the latest um, you know, missive or attack. So all of our Republican supporters have been as uh, supportive as ever, but it, I think it depends how long it, it goes on, how long affordable housing is in the crosshairs. It's, it feels, th there have been a lot of these actions like Peggy listed over the course of the administration, but in terms of you know, having the president tweeting about AFFH and things where it's like, does anyone even know what, what that means besides you know, those of us who work yeah. in housing? I mean, that does feel new. And um, I, I, I do wonder if it, continues if if it's going to have an impact but at least right now i don't think it has yeah yeah um peggy just just one last thing there was a um and i know we had we had slotted some time for it and then we've, we've had a very robust discussion and, and i'm sure we weren't going to get to everything but um but there was a question in the chat uh, about public housing uh and the investment in in public housing and i know um you would have potentially wanted to make some comments uh, about that. And so I'll, I'll just ask you if, if you had something on your mind specifically. Sure. So, you know, as uh, uh, Sarah mentioned, you know, thinking about public housing and, and a big investment in public housing is definitely needed. And obviously in New York and in New York City in particular, that uh, there is a huge need for more funds in the public housing capital fund. So that's something we're really hopeful that if an infrastructure package moves next year, we can get included. But in thinking, one of the things that is uh, fun right now is to think about that progress, that day when we can push more progressive policies, right? And, and, and reveling in the fact that 
Vice President Biden is talking about a housing entitlement and is talking about transformational change within affordable housing and what that opens up for us in a way that we in the housing world have never had before. And so that's a, so the other piece of this in a public housing space is what does public housing look like in the future? And how can we bring together LIHTC and have a real conversation about who lives in LIHTC units and how do we make some LIHTC units more affor permanently affordable for people at the lowest incomes with a recognition that, well, look, we're never going to build housing that's cheap enough for people with no incomes. That's just, that just doesn't make sense. The housing market is the place where we're building affordable housing, but we've got to do some, and we don't want to make the same mistakes that we've made in the past around segregating public housing in the communities that are disinvest, disinvested in or neglected in, and it's going to be hard, and we have to correct for the need for annual appropriations from Congress to make sure public housing stays a good place to live. So how do we do that? And I, I just I just want to encourage us to start thinking about that really explicitly so that we don't miss this moment and leave public permanently public permanently affordable housing for the lowest income people behind as we're doing all these other things. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very well said and well put. Um, I think we are. Um, I think we're done right at the uh, I think we had allocated an hour. Uh, I want to. On behalf of the network, I want to thank um, uh, Sarah, Peggy, and Emily for uh, a fantastic discussion. Um, and uh, it is recorded. Uh, and um, and so uh, if you want to go over um, anything that we've discussed again, feel free to to uh, to uh, fire up the recording and and, and listen and and uh, share it with uh, with your networks as well. So um, thank you all um, so much and. Um, have a great uh, weekend and uh, stay safe and, and healthy. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.